Right, it's kind of two parts in the fact that we're going to answer a few questions that uh, people have raised. We've done this in the past. Uh, for those of you guys who've been connected to Focus for um, for a few semesters, um, and tonight we definitely wanted to make sure that we uh, that we ended the semester off doing the same. Um, for those of you guys who submitted uh, some of the questions on Twitter, we definitely appreciate you guys for doing that. Um, it's totally anonymous as it relates to uh, the questions that we're going to put up on the screen. We're not going to have anybody's name or anything like that. Um, you know, some of you guys are like, I don't want to put nothing up here because I don't want nobody to know my question. I mean, that's fine. That's cool. Uh, but for those of you guys who were courageous, appreciate you guys uh, for doing so. So we're going to answer a few of those questions as well. I think Coco is going to put them up on the screen once we kind of have um, all of them. And, um, yeah, it's already there. Um, so bless the Lord for that. Uh, so we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. Um, but we're just going to kind of start off first just with the questions that we have. So let's pray really quick, and then uh, we'll get into it. Father, in Jesus' name, God, we thank you, Lord, um, just for what our eyes have seen and our ears have heard so far. We thank you, Lord God, that even on this last TNT of the semester, God, you have something for us. You've been giving it to us throughout uh, the course of uh, the few moments that we've already been together. And we pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would continue just to feed us, uh, continue to satisfy our thirst and our hunger for you, Lord God, in these next few moments that when we leave this place tonight lord god we will leave recharged we will leave energized lord god we will leave motivated um, to live for you on a regular basis we thank you and we love you in jesus name amen i um, just got a few questions that uh some people kind of submitted and there they are um a few uh juicy ones per se um so i think you guys are really um be be uh, really encouraged by them. Um, some of them are very, uh, not generic questions, but some of them are, they're, they're broad questions, but at the same time, they're very powerful in nature. And so uh, don't dismiss any question as if, oh, I know the answer, I'm good. You know what I'm saying? But no, like, like <laughs> take in uh, the, even the responses and in, in, in scripture references that come um, with every answer. I want to also let you guys know that I'm not answering these questions kind of based upon um, Edwin's theory and, and what I believe uh, works. Um, it's all based upon what God says for every question. So it's not like one of them things where I'm giving you a self-help type thing, um, but it's all it's all out of scripture. So uh, first question is, how do I look at things through God's perspective? Um, how do I look at things through God's perspective? It's a great question. Uh, one of the main things to do um, is to live my life when it comes to God's perspective. I have to live my life according to his word. Um, that is the uh, the beginning and the end to uh, having a godly perspective. It has to start with his word and it has to end with his word. And so my lifestyle should not be built upon what I hear other people say. It should not be built upon uh, what I see on Facebook or what I see in social media or what BET is pumping in my head or what VH1 or other people in my job and my class and my, and my house, my family, my life should only be predicated based upon the word of God. And when you begin to soak yourself and submerge yourself and connect yourself with the word, um, that is when your, that your perspective will begin to transform from your mentality to now having his mentality. Uh, Proverbs 3, chapter 5, or 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight. The key in that element is to lean not unto your own understanding. Because the idea is when I lean onto my own understanding, my understanding can't support my life. Um, I've told on this in the past before, but I know some of us in here are new. Uh, one of the correlations that are that that is synonymous with that particular text in Proverbs chapter three, verse five through six. Read it when you get home. Is when when the writer when Solomon talks about uh, lean not into your own understanding. The picture is if is as if uh, a person is leaning on a staff that has a tip at the, it has a point at the top of the staff. And so every time you lean on that staff as it's, as if it's a crutch with a cushion because it has a point at the end. Uh, which represents like there being some bit of a finite um, uh, finite structure to that particular um, rod or staff. When you lean on it, it causes you pain. It pierces you. It can't hold you up. That is the same correlation that he's trying to help us understand when it comes to leaning on our own understanding. What I mean by that? Because oftentimes when you and I lean onto our own understanding, it will lead to some pain. Like if you and I do what we think is right, a lot of times you found out that what you thought was right really was wrong. Right? Let's just call it what it is. You didn't know the answers all the time. Like, you didn't, you're not the perfect person. And so what the writer is helping us understand, what the word of God is helping us understand is that our understanding should be based upon God's word. Trust in him with all of your heart. Don't lean into your own understanding. In all of your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. And as I make a conscious effort to focus on his word, the more my mind begins to take the shape of his mindset. So Romans chapter 12, verse 2 talks about being transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
And the only way my mind can be renewed is if, in fact, it's rooted by the word of God. It's the word of God that pumps out all of the lies of the enemy. And now when I begin to digest the truth of God, I now begin to have what Paul says in Philippians 2 and 5, the mind of Christ. Does that, does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe so. Yes, cool. Uh, so, so my perspective is always going to be tied to what I believe. I'll say it again. My perspective is always going to be tied to what I believe. How do I know this? Because the first place that the enemy attacked in the beginning of time was the mind of Adam and Eve. So when he opposes Eve, when she's in the garden, when she's going through the trees and all this type of stuff, when she's doing her duty uh, as, as the woman of that time, when he comes to her, he says, what did God really say you couldn't eat from that tree? So already he's beginning to, uh, to challenge her thinking. Already he's beginning to challenge her perspective. Mind you, her perspective was shaped around the truth of God. But now because she's beginning to entertain the lie of the enemy, her mind goes to a place that it was never supposed to go. So now when she says, uh, surely God said that we will die if we eat from the tree. The enemy fires back and counters with a punch like Floyd Mayweather, Manny Pacquiao. That fight will probably never happen, by the way. Um, <laughs> but the enemy comes back and says, surely you won't die. He doesn't want you to eat from the tree because you will be like God. And so the Bible says that when she saw that it was pleasing, when it was pleasing unto the eye, when it was good for gaining wisdom and gaining knowledge, she ate. She gave some to her husband. Next thing you know, we are where we are. Thank God for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. <laughs> yeah. But he deals with the mind. The enemy don't care about how gifted you are. He don't care about the fact you got a 4.0. But if he can cripple you in your mind, it's a wrap. And so this is, this is why this is a great question because your perspective dictates your reality. Like how you view things will become what you end up living. So if I base my mind around a truth, then my reality will be truth. If my perception is rooted in a lie, then that's what my reality will become. Hope that answers the question. So Ephesians chapter 4, 23, it's a great scripture. Go there when you get some time. It talks about being made new in your mind. This is why this is a daily thing, man. Like when you wake up in the morning, one of the first things you ought to pray when you, when you talk to God is God renew my mind. I don't, I don't need the same things that I had yesterday. Especially for some of us in here who may have vivid dreams and all this type of stuff. The enemy works religiously with your mind. He, this is why he's constantly pumping things in your mind through music. Some of you guys in here ask the question plenty of times, what's wrong with secular music? Florida's cool with that. I love God. Here's the problem with secular music. The problem is it's pumping a message that is contrary to what God says. And now the more I dump this in my head, I know you think you're just listening to the beats. But it's no, that's how it gets you. A stage one, I get you bobbing to the beat. Next thing, you're dropping your draws. <laughs> yeah, I went there. <laughs> I went there because that's what you see in media. And isn't it crazy how the enemy gets us bobbing to lies, man? Pippin, 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 murder, murder, sell drugs. <laughs> Show Baraka, Lions and Liars, get that out. <laughs> But this is what we bob to, man. This is what we this is what we bang in our cars. This is what you banging on your iPod right now. And what you fail to understand, look, look what gates of your body it's coming in. It's coming in through your ears. Your ears is directly connected to your brain. You receive signals scientifically to your brain through your ears. So if it's doing that in the natural what do you think it's doing in the supernatural and the spiritual? That's why you can't pump everything that you, that you hear. You, you can't just take it like that. I know that's not easy preaching. I know that's not an easy message, man. But if you're talking about having a perspective of God, you cannot base your life and build your life around the lies of the enemy at all. When you look at most mainstream artists, they are selling lies and they are getting rich off of it. <laughs> For real. I say all the time, man, these mainstream artists, they don't care nothing about you and me. They get paid off of us. They live in, they driving a Bentley, they driving Rolls Royces, they driving uh, 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 Aston Martins, Vanquishes, and all this type of stuff, and, and you got to catch the bus. Who <laughs> care nothing about you? They getting paid off of selling you lies. 
That's all it is. So it's, it's going to be extremely difficult for me to have a godly perspective if everything that I digest and consume is a lie. So this is why Paul talks about that, that I, I die daily. That daily I got to crucify this thing. This is why for me, I don't got nothing in my music collection other than Christian music, whether it's rap, go-go, <laughs> old school, rock, country. I mean, whatever. <laughs> and, and here's what, I don't even know why I'm on this music rant. Maybe somebody needs this. Um, but it's 2012. There is so much good Christian quality music out there. It's ridiculous. There ain't no reason for nobody. Now, I don't really like that joke. Now, if you were in 2001, yeah. where it was like cross movement and <laughs> and 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 uh, the messenger and uh, and all these other artists that were, were weren't nothing at all, like they didn't really have any solid content or solid beats. You know what I'm saying? Like that was that's one thing. I grew up in that era. Now y'all cats got trip. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Woo! Now here's what I'm gonna say. Here's what I'm gonna say to you. If God can sustain me. Off of like only two legit Christian artists in 2001. Cross movements. <laughs> and the truth. Yeah, if he can sustain me off two artists, as well as some of you, all the guys in here, and some other people that I can tell you he sustained as well. If he can sustain you off two artists, now in 2012, you got a plethora of artists. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. It's plenty for you to eat from. And all of this is designed to get you to have the right mentality. And you got to also be careful now what you watch. Okay. Act like a lady. Think like a man. Right? Right? I'm not knocking the movie. I'm not knocking the movie. I haven't even seen the movie. I kind of want to see it because I heard it's pretty good. I heard Cameron Hart's pretty funny and all that type of stuff. But even that, you still got to be careful, man. Now, am I saying that the only thing you watch all the time is just Christian movies? <laughs> that your channel's on TV and all the time? It's on the church channel, it's on Word Network? <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is you got to be careful about what you allow to come through your ear gate and your eye gate. Because this is what shapes your perspective. Hopefully that answers the question. Um, Here's question number two. What does God say about animal abuse? It's a great question. What does God? It sounds weird, but this is a great question. What does God say about animal abuse? Right? Now, immediately when you think animal abuse, you probably thought of my quarterback, Michael Vick. Right? Hey, man, listen. Let me tell you something. God makes all things new. Uh-uh. <laughs> Any man who's in Christ is a new creature. No matter what he's done to creatures. New creature. Uh, what, but this is a great question. What does God say about animal abuse? Uh, now, specifically in the Bible, in the 66 books of the Bible, Hebrew, Greek, all that, Old Testament, New Testament, there's not anything like specifically that says if you kill an animal, if you pull a tail off a cat or something crazy like that, then this is what's going to happen to you. No, it doesn't necessarily explicitly and specifically say that. But there are numerous principles throughout the Bible as to how we, you and I, mankind, are to care um, for animals. One scripture that comes to mind is Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10. It says this, a righteous man cares for the needs of his animal, but the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. Say it again. A righteous man cares for the needs of his animal, but but the kindest acts of the wicked are cruel. Are cruel. In other words, uh, the writer here is, is connecting um, the man and his righteousness to even how he treats his animals. Mm-hmm. And here's the reason why the Bible says in Psalms that the earth is the Lord's and everything that's in it. And that includes animals. Now, am I saying that there's something wrong with eating cows and there's something and there's wrong with eating burgers and you need to be on some old vegan type stuff? I'm not, I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about like abusing them. Like you take pleasure in, 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 in seeing animals get decapitated. You know what I'm saying? Like you, 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 you see a squirrel on the side of the road. Man, that dumb squirrel. Look, I told you. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not saying that. You know, like, like there's something, there's something wrong, man. I'll share this with you. Uh, like God, for real, for real, kind of begin to like, like soften my heart a lot, even towards stuff like that. I remember there was one time I was on my way to service first thing in the morning, and I saw this squirrel in the middle of the road, and that shit was dead. Yo, about a year ago, a month ago, I'm like, there you go another one. I'm on bites of dust. Yo. When I saw that squirrel flattened, yo, my heart broke. I'm so serious, man. I told Cass this in our leadership meeting, man, a few weeks ago. Yo, my heart broke. And here was the reason why. Because the Jake that God helped me understand, he says, listen, man, that's my creature. And the only reason this creature is dead is because there's sin in the world. 
If there is no sin, animals don't die. That joint rocked my whole mentality. That joint, it, it really kind of softened and broke that heart. That was a stone towards seeing animals. Now, I wasn't one that, you know, was before, like, beat every... I wasn't like that. But I'm sure you and I could be honest and be transparent. Like, when we see dead things, we don't even make the connection that the only reason this jank died, the only reason this, this spider died, that you thought was designed to kill you, but that before the fall, this jank wouldn't even dare put its fangs in you. The only reason this jank is happening is because there is sin in the world. And the reason why you've gotten so used to it is because you and I have been so desensitized to what sin is. That's what it is. And so now when it comes to animal abuse, is that Jane wrong? Definitely. No question. Because this is God's creature. So I can't just sit up in this joint and the dog don't come to me. It's like, come on, man. No, you throwing chairs at it. And oh, my God. Beating it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you taking pleasure in it, man. Like, come on. It's God's creature. I'm sure Peter is loving it. Like, if, if Peter ever sees this message on, on, on YouTube, man, they are going to love Yeah! <laughs> now, I'm not saying that, you know, <laughs> that what is, so where, does, where you draw the line between, because when we talk about abuse, you got to sometimes classify abuse. Because everybody has different uh, association and different perceptions about what abuse is. So I think abuse is just me hitting my cat on his back. Another person may think abuse is, is chasing it in, in, on a bike. Another person, I mean, every, it's, it's subjective, but here's what I would say. Here's what I would say. Anytime you and I treat something that God has created beneath the purpose that he created it for, it is wrong. It's definitely wrong. Because that's not why he created it. No different than you and I using our body for the wrong reason that he created it for. The purpose and the principle is still the same. It does not change. Yes, the superficial may change, the issue may change, but the principle stays the same. God says anytime you and I do something outside of purpose, it is now perverted, which means it's being led not by the spirit, but it's being led by the enemy. All day long. Some of you guys may be watching the news. I remember on Yahoo a few weeks ago, there was this guy, um, Mr. Trump, Donald Trump, his son. His son is a well-known hunter, and his son caught a lot of flack because he went to Africa and he took a picture holding a tail. And the tail was the tail of an elephant. Now, when you see this picture, you're like, yo, this is brutal, man. And like, I'm talking, he's smiling at the joint, like, yeah. <laughs> yo, that joint made me mad, man. We know that as poachers. I just go out and just kill, just, just for fun. Hey, man, what you doing now? I ain't doing anything. Wanna go, go kill some deer? Wanna kill them? Ain't got nothing to do. <laughs> hey, it's, it's like playing basketball. Hey, man, you want to go play ball? Hey, let's go play ball. Hey, man, you want to go kill an elephant today? <laughs> what? So animal abuse, definitely, man. Because that's not what God intended. That's not his purpose. I'm going to tell you why this is so messed up. Because it shows the perversion of our hearts. That if we take the light and seeing something die, that's a problem. Oh, I killed that spot. Yeah. <laughs> take that. <laughs> We laugh, we joke about it, but why am I that hype about killing something? Watch this though. Ch ch check out how superficial and how like phony we are. Because we delight in killing this creature that God has created like it ain't nothing. But when somebody's little young boy gets killed, we go crazy. Both were created by God for a particular purpose. We should not delight in seeing anything die. Why is this true? When you look at the book of Matthew, chapter 6, one of the things that Jesus says when the disciples were worrying, he's giving them this whole message, this whole Bible study and sermon to talking about not worrying. God says, Jesus says, he says, listen, if the Father, if God in heaven, make sure that the sparrows have something to eat. Which means he cares about the animals, man. He ain't just creating animals just because. It's creation. Not at all. Now, is he cool with you using creation for your betterment, for, 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 for nourishment and stuff like that? Definitely. He talks about that all throughout the Bible. But it ain't no hunting for sport and stuff like that. I don't know about that. I don't know. Some of you guys are like, man, I got a problem with that because my pops trained me to hunt. Let me help you understand something. Pops may be wrong. <laughs> okay, you want, all right. Um, next time you think about it, Pray about it first. God, do you really want me to go 
go shoot this buffalo. A buffalo? Let me go squirrel hunting, shoot him with a BB gun. <laughs> oh, come on, come on. I mean, come on. Now, let, let's, let's call it what it is. Like, some of you guys were like me when you were younger, man. You heard the little myth about if you give a seagull an alcohol, it'll explode. <laughs> some of y'all wanted to see that joint, just like me. <laughs> And you ain't want nobody to see you, so you want to like catch a seagull in an isolated parking lot, buy an oak alcohol and put it on the ground. Oh, yeah. Think about it's a problem. Yo, we take the light in that stuff, man. That's a problem. It shows how cold our hearts are. But we don't think about that because it's so normal. We don't think about it. We've been desensitized. To really feeling what God feels. You killing the seagull, man. Yo, God mourns over that. That's his creation. Every time a seagull dies, it reminds him of the fact that death took place in the garden years ago. I just should grieve you. Now, I'm not saying go out and be an animal activist. I'm not saying that. Am I saying that when the circus comes to North of Scope, you with Peter, <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> you got posters and you got pickets. You're picking it outside in Norfolk Scope, you're camping out, you're sleeping there and all that type of stuff because you want to raise awareness. I'm not saying that. But what I'm talking about is just the absolute abuse of God's creation. Hope that answers the question. Here's the third thing. Third question. What to do if you're not raised in church and going to church regularly and reading the Bible on a daily basis? What do you do if this is a new thing for you? Great question. I'll say this for new believers. Uh, spiritual disciplines may be a challenge. And the reason why is because they're disciplines. Because I'm not accustomed to doing this particular thing. Sometimes I have to now retrain the way I do things. It's almost as if it's almost as if trying to have you're trying to uh, adopt a new diet. In order for you to adopt a new diet, that simply means that you have to now discipline yourself. You've been used to eating fast food and junk food. So you're not going to just go cold turkey and not have a desire for it anymore. Or not to say, or it's not going to be a struggle when it comes to trying to adapt to that new lifestyle, to that new eating regimen. But it's a discipline. And the goal is to understand that, hey, I don't have to be perfect with this thing, man. It's, God, God is not concerned about me keeping the letter of the law. Jesus did that. God is not concerned about me being perfect. He's concerned about me being holy. And so now when I think about things like Joshua chapter one, verse eight, reading when you get home, uh, God tells Joshua, he says, meditate on the word day and night. This is a spiritual discipline. We call this uh, spiritual breathing. When you're inhaling something, but then you're also uh, exhaling it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22 talks about uh, not forsaking the assembling of the saints. It's a discipline. It's a discipline to come here Tuesday night, week after week. It's a discipline to go to a church service, maybe Sunday after Sunday or Saturday after Saturday, whenever that service is. It's a discipline. And you have to discipline yourself in this area. And yes, it may hurt for a little while, but just like lifting weights, you got to be disciplined to doing that. And it may not feel good in the beginning, but you will love the payoff when it's all said and done. So it's a discipline. Acts chapter 2, verse 46, the Bible says that every day they continue to meet together in the temple courts, talking about uh, the early church. Talking about the church that, that came about after Pentecost. And that, that same chapter, chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit comes down in Pentecost, and then you see just a plethora of people giving their lives to the Lord. Peter preaches, 3,000 people get saved in one day. It's amazing. But it's a discipline. So you can't expect, even if, if I'm a new believer, I just got saved like last week. You can't expect to be on beast mode in one week. No different than you going into the weight room like, yeah, I'm trying to get swole. You can't get swole in one day. I don't care what you do. You can lift weights until veins start popping out. You can drink protein shakes like a mug. Yo, it's going to take time. And you got to be patient with the process. So it's, it's a discipline. The more I engage in the discipline and the habits, the more natural it becomes to where it's not a chore or it's not a... A, uh, a stretch or it doesn't hurt to do it, but now it's a lifestyle. Amen. So now Sundays, oh, pff, there ain't no option where I'm going. It's a lifestyle. Tuesdays is not an option. I mean, this is, just, this is just as natural as breathing to me. It's easy. It's, I mean, it happens. It becomes a lifestyle. It becomes a regiment. And, and when you don't, when you don't uh, connect the way you do or when you're not engaging in those habits like you should, you feel terrible about it. No different than for those of us in here, you've been disciplining yourself. You go work out on a regular basis. Your body begins to tell you when you take a day off. It's probably real quiet because some of us just don't work out in here. So you're like, my body ain't said nothing. 
<laughs> they were like, it, this joint has been saying the same thing for the past five years. Freshman 15, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but your body begins to tell, tell, and your body begins to communicate. Does it verbally say something? No, but you begin to notice the changes in your body. Yeah. You begin to lose that definition because you stop going one day and one day turned into two days. Mm. Two days turned into four. Four turned into eight. Mm -hmm. Eight turned into three, four months. Next thing you know, it's been a year since you've worked out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Such is the same now when it comes to our daily regimen and our walk with Christ. It's easy to miss one Tuesday. You miss one Tuesday. Oh, I'll, just, I'll get back next week. Something comes up the next Tuesday. Oh, dog, man, I got to miss this week too. Two turns into four. Four into eight. Next thing you know, your lifestyle is jacked because the discipline wasn't there. Such the same thing with reading your word. I know sometimes for some of us, it's a beast to read your word because you're so busy, right? Even though like you have a lot of time during the day, you're really busy. Uh, there's just not enough time in the day, even though it's 24 hours. You just don't have five minutes to even open up your word at all. I know, I know you're busy. Yes, bless the Lord, you're busy, man. God knows, he knows. So you're like, you know, I'll take off one day, man. You know, I, you know, I, you know, I, I, I'll dig in my word hard tomorrow. And that one day turns into two. Two turns into four. Four turns into eight. Next thing you know, the last time you talked to God was two months ago. Mm. And then when you look at your life, you're like, you're like, why is my life crazy? Your life is crazy because you stopped being disciplined. And even when you get to the place where you think you've mastered it, you really haven't mastered it. You never get to a place spiritually where you're like, hey, I'm good. I'm swollen in the spirit. I don't need to work out no more. No, not at all. Even those who are the most physically fit athletes, they will tell you that you don't reach a plat. You keep working out because the minute you stop is the minute you'll go out of shape. It's the same thing when it comes to cutting your grass. Anybody in here knows anything about that? You can cut your grass every week and that yard is looking banging. I'm talking like grass is shining. <laughs> you got it glistening to it You know what I'm saying glistening. Flowers are blooming Mulch is looking good You know pick the weeds up Out the flower bed All that type of stuff And you You went hard for a month Take one week off Let it rain <laughs> Weeds will begin to pop up Out of nowhere If you don't stay disciplined It's going to be very hard for you To continue to grow In your relationship with the Lord, which kind of leads to the next question. Why is submitting to God so hard? How can I do this? And you guys ever dealt with anything like that? Like, it seems like sometimes submitting to God is kind of difficult. Submitting to God is so difficult. Here's why. Because by nature, we want to do what we desire to do. The Bible talks about it's this warring on the inside. It's this spiritual warfare. It's this war between the carnal man, the flesh man, what I want to do, my own heart, my own desires. And it's in war against what God wants. And the reason why it's so strong is because you and I have been accustomed to doing stuff our way for so long. As I said, it's a discipline. And so now this whole notion of giving up everything to follow Jesus, like what he says in Luke, to follow him, I wrestle with it. Because I've never had to make a choice and decision like this. It's a beast. I got to get rid of this music. If I'm going to grow. I got to cut some people off. It's a discipline. And the reason why is because flesh wants to do its thing and spirit wants to do his, right? Paul talks about this in the book of Romans chapter 7, verse 14 through about chapter 8, verse 1. Read that when you get home. He talks about the good that I wanted to do. I, I, I don't do it. I can't do it. And the stuff that I don't want to do, I end up doing. He says, oh, what a wretched man I am. Who can save me from this? Then he opens up in chapter 8, verse 1. Thank God <laughs> I have a Savior in Jesus Christ who can rescue me from this state of being. And so the other reason why submitting to God is so hard is because even when I'm trying to submit to God, if I'm the one doing the work, I will always fail. So now, even if I'm a Christian and even I'm, I say, you know, I'm reading my Bible, I'm coming to TNT, I'm worshiping the YouTube videos like they do in TNT, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I got a devotional book and all this type of stuff, I'm hanging around Christian and godly people, man, I got Trip banging on my iPod, I got Show Baraka, I got, you know what I'm saying, uh, William Murphy, William McDowell, I got all this type of stuff, I got Britt Nicole, I got all this type of stuff in my life, 
but it seems like there's nothing really taking place. The reason why I think Brandon and B. Lee said it earlier this semester or earlier a few weeks ago in this month, you're working too hard because you're trying to do it yourself. This is why it's called in Galatians 5, the fruit of the spirit. Because when you yield to the spirit, he produces through you. So when you and I say, Lord, have your way. When you and I begin to relinquish control over our life, he begins to work. It's as natural as breathing. You don't have to think about breathing. You just do it. Right? And notice when you try to think about breathing, it's kind of hard to breathe. Right? But it choked to death. Such is the same now when it comes to your relationship with God. When you submit yourself to him, it just happens. When you say, Lord, have your way. You know, I'm just going to live every day to honor him, please him. The struggle is just coming to the reality of, of submitting to him. Not in the doing. God is not concerned about it. He does the work. You just got to submit. A lot of times what happens is because you and I have been brought up in a culture, if you and I have been co- connected to a church, people always pumped in your head, you got to do this, you got to do that, you got to do this thing, you got to do that thing, you got to say prayer this way, you got to say prayer that way. God's not concerned about that. He says, be. Be holy because I am holy. And when you notice obedience, first three letters, O, B, E. <laughs> be, not do. It's not about doing. It's about being. So if if I'm being submitted to God, then he begins to perform the work in me. That's the good news, man. You and I can't muster up godly fruit on our own. I don't care how hard you try. You and I, people do good things all the time and they boast about them. The only reason they did good things was not because of the fact that they wanted to do a pure good thing for somebody else. It was because they were motivated by their own selfish love. But when you and I, uh, what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, motivated or compelled by the love of Christ, he now does the work. So submitting to God is sometimes difficult because I want to do one thing, flesh that is, and then the spirit man wants to do something different. Jesus even wrestled with this in the garden. He said, if it's possible, take this cup from me, but not my will, let yours be done. As long as you are in flesh, you will always have this war taking place until you reach this place. Uh, what theologians call glorification, when now you are free from the presence of sin. But that ain't here. That, that's not there yet. We're not there yet. <laughs> you, are, you and I every day are in the presence of sin. We are in these, uh, these, these broken or these, these earthen vessels, as Paul would say in Corinthians. And as long as you and I are in flesh, you and I are always going to be tempted by fleshly things. Notice I said tempted, not you doing fleshly things, because it's a choice what you want to do. The devil don't make you do nothing. Influenced you, so stop blaming the devil. Devil made me a devil, man. He just made me do it. Devil ain't make you do nothing. He made it look real good. He dressed it up real nice. He made it pretty and glamorous, but he didn't make you do anything. So, uh, how can I submit to God? I submit to God by making the decision to let God have control over my life and by living my life in a way that pleases Him. Ephesians chapter four, verse one talks about living a life worthy of the calling you've received. Here's the next question. So if you belong to a quote unquote different kind of this is a change of pace from the other questions. If you belong to a quote unquote cultish cultish type of church, should I still go back to it if it's still in some way a reflection or reflecting Christ's love? I'll say it again. If I belong to a quote unquote cultish type of a church, should I should I still go back to it if it's still in some way reflecting Christ's love? Simple answer. No. <laughs> Here's why. I should only be connected to a church that is concerned about pleasing God, not on fulfilling rituals or religious acts. In addition to this, there is no true church that can be cultish and at the same time reflect Christ's love. It's impossible. A cult is something that does not honor God, which means the love will always be absent. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If love is not the motivational factor in it, then it can't be a true church. At all. Love has to love is the is the foundation for the church. That's what the Bible says. God is love. He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation. It starts and it ends with him. And so if, if I'm connected to a place where the love of Christ is absent, but it's all about sin, it's all about doing this, it's all about you gotta get baptized in order for you to go to heaven, all this type of crazy stuff. If people lift up rituals more than they lift up relationship, wrong church. Which leads me to the next question. 
What should I look for in finding a church home? Good question. What should I look for in finding a church home? Number one, look for sound doctrine. What do I mean by doctrine? Uh, faith statements, beliefs. What is what, what are the core values of that particular church? Here's some core values. I can't. I don't even have time to go through all of them because there's so many. Um, but some of the key fundamentals. Number one, that there's one God who eternally exists in three persons: Father, Son, Spirit. Now they come up, you come up to you and be like, "Hey, we believe in Jesus, but then we also believe in this." <laughs> no, <laughs> no, not at all, not at all, not at all. One God, Trinity <coughs> concept. Father, Son, Spirit, all of God, functioning as one. Uh, also, uh, another, another fundamental key value, that the Bible is the authentic and infallible word of God. It's an error. In other words, that there is no error in the word of God. That these 66 books that have been co- composed, that have been canonized, 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 if you will, that have been put together by people who were spirit-led, just as the ones who were spirit-led in the pinning of the pages and of the Holy Scriptura, if you will, if people believe anything in addition to the Bible, no. No. We believe the Bible, but we also believe this book. That's not, that's not biblical. Uh, that God created mankind to have fellowship with him, but through the disobedience of Adam, first man, uh, sin enters into the world which broke the fellowship between God and man. You gotta believe that. In other words, uh, there needs to be a clear understanding that we all are sinners. Like the church is not a place where we just come for self-help. No, no, like there needs to be a clear understanding that you and I, that we, we are like filthy rags, is what the Bible says, in need of a savior. Why? Because of the disobedience of Adam, which now gives way to sin, now to enter into the world, which now opens up the door. We need a savior. We need somebody to redeem us, to reconcile us back to God. Fellowship between man and God was broken the minute sin enters into the world. So we need, we need somebody who will now be what Paul says, the mediator between God and man. So now here enters Jesus the Christ, the son of God, who is the last Adam, not the second Adam. Last. Second implies that it could be a third. First Adam, Adam. Second Adam is what it talks about, like Romans chapter five, Jesus Christ, who comes to restore fellowship with God. John 14, six, he says that I am the way, the truth and the life. Nobody comes to the father, but through me. So if your church, or if you see churches that say, yeah, we believe in Jesus as the prophet, but there are plenty of ways in which people can get to heaven. No, that's, that's not, that's not sound doctrine. That's not, that's not true belief. Yes, there are plenty of other religions, but Christianity is the only one that can boast in the risen savior. So if you came here tonight, trying to figure out where you want to believe. Let me help you understand. Every other person in any other religion has died and never came back. <laughs> Jesus the Christ is the risen Savior. Woo! Woo! Died on a cross and showed how much power he has by getting up out of the grave. Woo! He is the living God. That's what distinguishes Christianity from any other religion in the planets, on the planets. More than what Tom Cruise and all of John Travolta and Scientology got to say. All of that. Buddha, Muslims, Islam, whatever. (laughs) Judaism. Yeah. He is the risen Savior. And that is what, those are some of the things I should be looking for uh, in the church. Also, the Holy Spirit. Understanding the nature of the Spirit. A lot of times, man, what happens, especially in today's Christian context, Holy Spirit gets downplayed. Let me help you understand something. If it's not for the Holy Spirit, you can't live a Christ-centered life at all. All throughout Jesus' ministry, while he was in flesh here on the planet, walking amongst man, walking amongst the disciples, the Bible constantly talks about how he was led by the Spirit. Matthew 4, Luke chapter 4 talks about he was, how he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. It also talks about the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Now rest in you, Holy Spirit. He is the power that you need to be able to live a life of empowerment. And without him, you can't do it. So Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. So I can't downplay the Holy Spirit. I can't. Uh, a lot of times we have a false understanding of the Spirit. They call the Spirit the it. You know, when, when it falls on me. No, no, help me, help me understand something. Holy Spirit is a person. Jesus says when he comes. <laughs> he will guide you in all truth. He, not it. All's doctrine. 
So when people get all spiritual and say, just when the Holy Spirit falls, he, it, it's, it just allows you to do this. Well, hold on. It? How about he? Already. Red flag. <laughs> Misunderstanding. Here's another thing. So you got sound doctrine. Um, another thing. Sound biblical preaching and teaching. If, cast, you, you, if you're connected to a church and all they're doing is preaching self-help type stuff, there's a problem. Yeah. This uh, prosperity gospel, if you will. But God wants to make you famous. God is going to do something incredible in your life. And I just prophesy and speak. I speak prosperity. I press it in your life. I'm still broke. <laughs> Or the self-help type stuff. Yes, you can. Yes, you did. <laughs> like Obama. Yes, we did. What? Why? If you're not telling me that I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, then what you're preaching is a message that's not rooted in the Lord. And unfortunately, a lot of churches in today's context are obsessed with feel-good messages. Let me help you understand something. Gospel is not a feel good type of thing. Jesus talks about that that the kingdom suffers violence and the violence taken back by force. He says, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. <laughs> yeah. It's not gonna feel good. Like the word of God, when it's being authentically preached and taught, it should cause some stuff to be uncomfortable in your life. So you're shacking up with somebody right now. The word of God says, listen, until two become one, you have no business being with them. It should make you uncomfortable. If you need any convicting, conv uh, uh, convincing that the word of God is true, the fact that you feel uncomfortable when that word goes forth shows that the word of God is real. Sound biblical preaching and teaching that leads people back to Christ. If it's not about leading people to the Lord, it's false doctrine. A pastor who loves God is key. Not a lover of themselves, as what it talks about in 2 Timothy 3. Not who has a form of godliness but denies his power. Not somebody who just rolls around with a five-piece suit, with a BMW car, you know what I'm saying, looking all nice and just saying, I'll pray for you, God bless you, and all this type of stuff. But when you need something, they know where to be found. No. Not a person who has a love for money, man, who just wants to get rich. One of the things that bothers me now in today's context, you have all these, you have a lot of well-known pastors who are living large, but the cats in your church suffering. There's a problem. Now, I don't have no problem with you driving nice. That's cool. But if every member in your congregation is catching a bus, that's a problem. <laughs> it's a problem, man. So you need a pastor, someone who has a heart for God. God says in Jeremiah 3.15, he says, I will give you shepherds or pastors, if you will, after my own heart. You want somebody who has a heart for God. Because if he has a heart for God, then that now will be communicated through everything that is done within the life of a church. Also, you need a church that's passionate about making disciples. If your church is all, all they're concerned about is just having church, having church, <laughs> how you have church? <laughs> you know, I mean, we say it a lot of times, but we don't really understand what it means. I'm, I'm gonna have, we gonna have some church today. <laughs> we gonna go to church. You gonna go to church. You are the church. <laughs> Gotta understand this type of stuff, man. A church that's passionate about making disciples. So if nobody's getting saved, if nobody's being reached with the authentic love of Christ, and you call yourself a church, no, you're not. You're just a nonprofit organization that's all about self help and leaving. You're not really making disciples. You're not really leading people to Christ. Matthew chapter 28, verse 16 through 20, one of the final uh, instructions that Jesus gives to disciples, which also represents us as the disciples that he's talking to. Go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations. Teach them to obey. Yeah. That's what should be happening within a church. If your church is not doing that, I'm not saying that your church is not godly, but it should raise some attention where it should now convict you to the point where now it causes you to raise some questions. Why are we not doing this? If, if you are connected to a church and all they got is 80-year-old people. Aww. <laughs> what's going to happen when they die? <laughs> Looking for a new church. <laughs> we got to make disciples, man. Your church should all be about soul winning, man. If it's not about soul winning, what are we doing? We're just a nonprofit organization. 
a church that's a community. Like your church should be about a community. As a matter of fact, I think uh, this kind of goes to the second question right here. My friend considers focus her church and doesn't go to church on Sundays. Is that wrong? I won't say that's wrong, but I will definitely say that it's important for you to be connected. While it's definitely uh, encouraging to know how much focus blesses you on a regular basis. And I really understand that, especially after everything that God kind of exposes you to here, it's sometimes tough to go back to a place that is not really growing. So this is why sometimes during the summertime, it's hard for you to go back because you're like, I'm not going to grow there. But let, let me help you. Let me encourage you. One of, one of the main reasons why God put you here for a season is so that way he can build you up and grow you and deposit in you what he wants you to take back to them. So that now the church that looked dead, now he uses you as almost an Ezekiel type person, Ezekiel chapter 37, where now you begin to prophesy to those dead places or you begin to speak to those dead places in the power, in the word of God. And now dead places now begin to take on life. That's what it's about. But it's about understanding it's a community. The church is about a community, man. The church is not a building. Not at all. The church is not four walls. If we demolish a church and it's considered, if the church is considered a building, we demolish it, then there goes your church. The church is the people. The Bible says that your body is the temple. You are the church. You are the community, man. It's the community of believers. That's what the church is. It's not a building. A lot of times, you know, uh, people ask you, where are you going? I'm going to church. <laughs> what? No. If anything, you say I'm going to church service. Because a lot of times what happens is because we have the mentality that I'm going to church, then now what that entails is when I leave church, I leave everything I got in church, in church. So now everything that took place within the four walls never makes its way out because I don't understand the mentality that the church is not the four walls, but the church is me. This is why when you fall short and you're claiming to be a believer, other people will say, that's why I don't like church people now. Isn't it strange how some people who don't know nothing about God understand more about God? People who are not even connected to church understand more about it than we do sometimes. They understand that you represent the church as an ambassador. This is what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 5. We're ambassadors of Christ. And when you and I do something that is impure, when you and I do something that is not God honoring, it smears the body of Christ. It smears the church. It gives Christ a black eye. People see that. And so you got to understand that the minute you make a decision to make Jesus Lord over your life, you represent him as an ambassador. You are part of the body of Christ. You are many members in one body. You are the bride of Christ. That's what the church is. Let me help you understand something. I make you look. Now I'm gonna get graphic. I'm gonna just get real. If we're the church, and as so often as it happened in the Old Testament time, where God looked at the children of Israel as His bride, so many times what happens is we prostitute ourselves to other people and other things in life. We're the bride of Christ, but yet we act like we're on the corner. We sell ourselves to everything. You give yourself to anybody. Anybody that look good, you just give yourself to them. Jesus says, aren't I enough? Why are you prostituting yourself? And I'm not just talking about personally, but I'm talking about the church as a whole. When the church begins to sell out and be silent on issues that are real, you're selling yourself. Yeah. When the church begins to condone the fact that uh, uh, homosexuality is cool to be made a law, it's a problem. Am I by all means saying that homosexual pe- people who engage in homosexuality are, 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 are worse sinners than anybody else who sins? Not at all. The Bible says all have sinned. But when the church begins to act silent and shrink back from what her calling is, that is when you and I begin to lose our power. So now we can't be a light in a dark place because we're just a dark in a dark place. That's all we are. Church is a community. Acts chapter 2 verse 46. You'll see that um, there in that book. Here's the last question. If I pray on something and I feel like I've been given an answer but constantly hear the opposite, how do I distinguish between the two? I'll read it again. If I pray on something and I feel like I've been given an answer but constantly hear the opposite. How do I distinguish between the two? Great question. One of the things that you got to always do as I opened up early and as I closed with the same thing, you have to go back to the word of God. Does what you're hearing line up with God's word? Why is it so profound? Because when you go back to the setting that Eve was having, when Eve was having a conversation with the enemy, there should have been a huge red flag to go off in her head. The enemy is saying something that God did not say. But because she did not 
engaged in submitting herself to the word of God and accepting it as the truth of God. The Bible says in Romans 1, they exchanged a truth for a lie. If I don't stay submitted and prostrate before the Lord using his word, then it's going to be extremely hard for me to distinguish. So this is why your spiritual disciplines are so important. This is why it's important to come to TNT. This is why it's important for you to be connected to a church. Because these institutions, everything that God has set up here, whether it's a local church, whether it's a campus ministry, God sets it up so that way you can understand what his purpose is and what his will is for your life. And if I'm disconnected on that level, and if I'm not engaging in my daily reading, if I'm not engaging in daily prayer, daily meditation, daily worship, it's going to be impossible for me to understand what God is saying. I may be thinking that God is saying one thing and in fact it's the enemy talking. The more you spend time with God, the more you understand his voice. Some of you in here, you could testify to this. If your mother was to come in here, you didn't know she even walked in here. You didn't even know where she was in the room. But if she was to call out your name right now, you would know that that is your mother. Because you spent time with your mother. Such is the same with your heavenly father. The more time you spend with him, the more his voice becomes clear. The less time you spend with him, you will think he, Satan, is your father. <laughs> That's why Jesus calls him the father of lies. Missing it. So this is why it's so important. That's why it's important for you to be connected. This is why it's important as you leave and as you go throughout the course of the rest of this semester and as you make your way through the summer, it's important for you to stay connected. These things that we've kind of talked about when it comes to looking for a church, you got to employ these type of things, man. And let me help you understand something. All of this is to be spirit led. Like, don't just go off of a church saying that, man, this church really looks good because they got all the bells and whistles. They got a website. They got a YouTube page. They got a Twitter account. They tweet every five seconds. No, man. Them cats may have that form of godliness, but deny his power. You got to be spirit led when you go and connect with a community of believers. You got to ask yourself, am I getting fed? If I'm not getting fed in the place, what in the world am I doing here? <laughs> if I'm not growing at all, why am I still here? God, what are you trying to do? And if God does keep me here for a season, it's not necessarily, meant necessarily just for growth purposes as in feeding me the word of God more so that it may be growing me externally. So growing my habits, growing my decision-making skills, growing my patience, growing my love. These are the type of things that you got to look at. But do not make the cardinal sin that most believers make, especially young adults, especially when breaks take place. Because we think that when it's break time, we take a break. I'm done for the semester. I'm good. For those of us who graduate, you know, you, you were in, in focus for a season, man. God has been, really been growing you. And then as we talked about last week, Pat, last two weeks, man, because we fail to understand where God is taking us next, we just go back to the past. So now, now what happens is I graduate, I graduate from ODU and I think that I've graduated from Christianity and I'm good. I don't need to be connected anywhere. No, you need to be connected somewhere on a regular basis. Let me ask you the question, man. If you don't eat, what you think is going to happen? You're going to die. Such is the same in the spirit. It's a reflection. If you're not eating on a regular basis, if you're not connected to a chef, somebody who's in the kitchen constantly preparing the word of God for you, you will be malnourished. You will die at some point. You will experience a famine in your life. You will experience drought in your life. But get connected. I close with this. Colossians chapter 1 verses 10. I want you to verse 10. Look at this when you get home. This is a powerful scripture in Colossians chapter 1 verse 10. But Paul talks about this. He lifts up this principle. And he lifts up the very thing that we've really kind of opened up this whole thing with. And the very thing that we talked about from the start of the semester. He says this. He says uh, in verse 9, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the spirit gives. Pause. You can't get understanding from anyone or anything but the spirit. He gives you the wisdom. He gives you the knowledge that you need. Verse 10, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. Bearing fruits in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of his light. Powerful scripture, man. Powerful from top to bottom. My favorite part is this so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. Please him in every way. This is what God wants. 
When you look at your life, the question I want you to ask right now, am I pleasing the Lord in every way possible? Am I living a life worthy of him or am I living a, living a life that grieves him? Am I living a life that glorifies him or am I living a life that, that, that causes him to experience sorrow? Yeah. Am I, am I causing him to be how Jesus was when he saw the city and he wept because they were like sheep without a shepherd? When he sees my life, what, what does it look like? Can, 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 can he say, well done, my good and faithful servant. This is my son. This is my daughter in whom I am well pleased. Can he say that? And once again, this is not concerned about doing because some of your minds just went to, I got to do this. I got to do that. It's not about that. It's about being. It's about being submitted to him, giving your total life to him, giving your heart to him, your goals. The goals that you have charted up on your, in your house, on your refrigerator. Are those goals spirit-led or are they self-led? Your dreams, your aspirations, your desires, are they something that's rooted in the spirit? Are they something that's rooted in the word of God? Or are they in fact rooted in your own desires? This is the question that you got to ask. I, I don't know about you. I want to live a life worthy of the Lord. And I want to please him in every way possible. And I understand that God wants every aspect of my life. He wants how I treat my wife. He wants how I drive my car. He wants how I maintain my house. He wants my music. He wants my sleeping habits. He wants my eating habits. God desires and wants everything. And here's the reason why he deserves it. He deserves it because he gave everything for you. And because he gave everything to you and everything to me, the least that you and I can do is be holy. It's to be submissive to him. God, not my will, but let yours be done.